Tobin, you're well known as a gay activist, a performer and educator. Now, tell us a little bit about what makes Tobin tick. Wow, that's a very general question. Um, I think I am motivated by injustice, ultimately, and trying to, um, you know, make my life um, a better, but at the same time, um, you know, exploring the struggles that I've experienced and that I see other people experiencing and finding ways to, to better that experience, really. These things that you do, these different hats that you wear, um, obviously evolved over time. So let's go back to the beginning, perhaps, to, mm. to your childhood and, and how it evolved, how you, when you realised you were gay and what environment you were living in. I was um, born in North Sydney and spent the first year at Milsons Point. don't remember any of that. Um, and then family moved to the northern beaches uh, of Sydney. And I can recall from a very young age feeling um, that who I was wasn't represented by things around me. When you're that young, you don't... Um, you can't identify no, exactly. Yeah. But I knew that there was something that I was that was different. Um, I was very close to nature. Um, I was very excited by having little pet lizards and all that kind of carry on and was a member of the Gould League and enjoyed school. And, um, but I was very petite. Um, I wasn't effeminate, but I was very petite. And so I was like this uh, magnet for bullying and for um, mainly other boys to see me as a target. And so that kind of added to that feeling of different. Were you a single child? A single? You know, no, one of f uh, four siblings. Uh, the I have a sister younger and two brothers older. And the, what was the interaction relationship there at those earlier years? My eldest brother I always looked up to. He was five years older than me, very talented musician and still is. Uh, and the brother who was 18 months older than me, quite a bit of horn locking. Um, and since my mother has sort of said that maybe there was a bit of, uh, from her previous alcohol use, that maybe she saw him as a scapegoat and me as a kind of uh, mascot. That's how she described it. I'm not sure if that added to the conflict and tension. So that relationship was extremely volatile and that was kind of the source of a lot of um, the bullying. Younger sister, five years younger, wasn't around until I was five and that was a she was a curio, I guess, for the first part of my life. You were saying your mother had a drinking problem, did you say? Yeah, look, she's been dry now for over 35 years, still calls herself an alcoholic. Um, I don't recall there being any unusual behaviour. I think she was probably a fabulous, discreet 60s housewife medicator doing the um, barbiturates and the alcohol like I think a lot of housewives in the West were doing at that time. What about Dad? Tell us about your father. Dad. Uh, is, was a mechanical engineer and very loving, you know, their father, um, present. Um, I, you know, in retrospect, now that I hear stories of parents unfolding, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it was certainly not, there was nothing major and dramatic that I can look back and feel that it was stressful. It seemed like a very charmed early part of my life. So I wonder, did that last through the uh, t talk us through the period when you decided or realised that you were gay and you had to tell somebody in the family. Well, I didn't. This is the interesting thing because uh, obviously I felt very different, very isolated, and that continued all through school. Um, and it kind of hit the beginnings of a sort of personal crisis. Um, our family moved to Western Australia, so in 1975 I finished my high school years in Perth. Um, and in the 70s in Perth, there was a, a gay scene, but I didn't know how to really connect to that, and I didn't know how to talk to my friends. There was this enormous shame that was um, you know, directed from external homophobia, I realise now in retrospect, and you know, lack of role models or stereotypes, poor role models. So I found myself um, very anxious, and I had to go back to Sydney when I'd finished my high school years and explore my life. I didn't come out at that time. My father was li living in Indonesia working. My parents had split up by then and my mum was in Brisbane. And 
I think mum knew I was different, um, but I thought, why do I have to explain my sexuality, whatever that is, when none of my siblings have had to sit around a table and explain what their sexuality is um, in all its variety. So I, I didn't want to have to explain something because I didn't see the problem residing in me. I felt the problem was being enforced upon me externally. So I just didn't edit what I wrote. It was the days of writing letters. So I would write letters to dad in Indonesia saying I'm just joined the Sydney Gay Youth Group and I'm helping out at the workshop at Mardi Gras, making some costumes with Doris Fish and, and being creative and being a wonderful loving dad, he'd write back saying, as long as you're happy, I, I want you to be happy and I'm glad that you're doing things. So It was a sort of neat and, and seamless way of coming out. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the coming out process I, I see as an acknowledgement of something being wrong and mm. I didn't see it as yes. something being wrong personally. Tell me, in those days at that age, when you were a teenager, mm. uh, your peer group would have been talking about their sexual relationships or wannabe relationships and would have included you. How did you deal with that? I hung with the kind of, I don't know what you'd call it now, kind of an unusual group of people. So we weren't the kind of geek high achievers, we weren't the real troublemakers. Uh, it was an interesting high school. It had um, an integration of severely physically disabled students, one of the first schools in Australia to, to have that integration. Um, and so there was in slightly different dynamics, I think, from your average high school. I There wasn't a huge amount of discussion around that, but I mean, I can remember sitting on the lap of the school girl that all the jocks wanted to be with and that, that, that somehow it wasn't discussed. It was almost like there was this agenda that everyone kind of knew was going on but weren't able to deconstruct and, and talk about. So it was fascinating. But for me, a lot of just self-censoring, silence, just using um, my humour and being vivacious as a person and a bit of an eccentric individual to maybe be the smoke and mirrors, I'm not sure. But, Did yeah. the bullying continue into your teenage years? Not as much. Not as much in high school. I kind of used my um, a little bit of social standing on leverage that I had with a, an elder brother who was a respected musician locally and we were kind of known as the slightly uninteresting, slightly arty family from the East Coast. So I ha had a little bit of um, shielding, buffering and, yes. and shielding f from that. At what point did that become the activist? When did you start uh, becoming an activist? Because at that stage you were not an activist, you weren't a performer. Tell us about the transition. Well, and of I'd... course when, when Vanessa Wagner came on the scene, mm. it was your alter ego, which we'll talk about shortly. Yeah, I don't know where that activism came from. I was always a bit um, wary of... Um, you know, lack of uh, a selection of things around me. So I found commercial radio used to really horrify me. So I'd hunt down interesting music with the help of my brother and, and always liked things that were a little bit different. So I'm not sure if that's, that's activism. Um, it was probably not until um, I got back to Sydney that I realised um, after attending the Sydney Gay Youth Group and having some um, academics and some historians, GLBT historians, come to the group and talk to us about what had happened prior to us that I, it really kind of hit home um, what a difficult life some, some of us have had. And, and this is during a period where my existence was illegal. I mean, homosexuality wasn't decriminalised in New South Wales until 1984. So I was a criminal um, for the first you know, six or seven years of my potentially sexually active life. And I was horrified at that and uh, angry about that. And, you know, I really wanted to, to change those things. So I, that, that was probably what really pushed it, that I felt as a, a citizen that didn't break the law and tried to contribute to the culture of my surroundings was um, told they didn't have the same rights. That... Did you ever come across, as an adult at any time, did you ever come across physical danger because you were a homosexual? 
an enormous amount of ongoing um, verbal abuse and I l luckily avoided a couple of potentially lethal situations because I can run. So I've managed to run out of some violent situations, develop some sixth sense, um, discussing with various people um, strategies of being safe in, in environments. Um, but it's, the, it's often the looks that are the most um, distressing and upsetting or people ignoring you or tussing you or you know. Let me ask you though if, you, if you're able to point to what might have been the triggers for potential violence against you. Was it just your presence or was it something you said or did? No, I mean I was walking down streets minding my own business you know on Sunday nights or Monday nights with files in my arms. I mean I nearly got bashed by five people. My, I believe it's um, people who we are poorly represented, still are. The stereotypes in the media or the lack of information breeds a sense of unsureness in people and potential contempt. So I think it's a cultural thing. I think people are frightened. and But it still confounds me why, for example, someone might come from right out in the suburbs and make a trip right into the inner city of Sydney, for example, to hunt down someone they detest or don't understand. I would imagine a complete you'd want stranger, to, like yeah, you. Yeah, I, I'm wondering why would they? Wouldn't you want to hang with the people you feel comfortable with? So I think it's based in fear of the other and lack of representation, and also all the um, hideous associations that we were dirty, disgusting, pedophiles. It was unnatural. Um, these messages are strong and and fuel people's um, behaviour sometimes. But you've, uh, as you were saying, you've developed ways of dealing with that now. Um, and in fact, more than that, you're helping others. Tell us a little bit about the work that you do in, in health education particularly. Well, I, I developed um, a, a character. I, I danced for quite a few years and a lot of that dance was sort of satirical response to what I saw as confusing and you know arcane Western um, self-indulgent dance. So that in itself was a bit of a political comment on that part of culture and I used to throw parties and developed this character and it seemed like whatever I did became uh, political because drag in itself was at that time had quite a, um, a strict confines of what was right and what was wrong and what you did and what you didn't and my character just flouted those conventions and chose to be who she was. So you mean within the drag community? Yeah. You, you were an outsider That's there right. as well. Yeah, and still are <laughs> to some degree. And that all coincided with my seroconversion, which was coming into contact with HIV around 1990. Um, and so it was sort of that point onwards was the development of this character. And because I didn't want to hide anything, um, I didn't I mean, our sexuality is important. People say don't flaunt it, and it's, yet it's the, it's the thing, the central theme in most Hollywood films is the romance uh, section. So we, it is very much a part of us. So um, I'm going on a tangent there. But the character um, was there to help me be out about my HIV status and therefore reduce stigma. So by talking about it, being public and proud and not hiding, that, that became a powerful message for other people. It became a tool for survival tool for survival and it also became um, part of my work so people saw me as, as someone who could be used as a spokesperson. So instead of sitting in a dark corner obsessing and worrying about it, you went out and proclaimed it and celebrated it in a sense? I, yeah, I didn't, want to, I didn't want to die, I felt like I was too young and I had lots to say and that was the decision. It was like, am I going to um, succumb to this virus? And at that time we were told we were going to die and we were going to be judged and we deserved it. And I, being a fighter, I was like, no way, I will go the other way. Tell us about the, the, the time that you were diagnosed with HIV. What, what were the circumstances that was your first reaction? Well, I hadn't been enormously sexually active. I'm socially very um, confident, but as far as that kind of relationships and picking up and that whole scene, I never have been particularly confident. So I hadn't been very sexually active. A few friends around had contracted HIV, not a lot. It's mainly people a little bit older than me. I didn't really feel like I was at risk, um, but I was feeling sick and I was having some symptoms that suggested I may have come in contact with the virus. Really frightened of needles and the medical gaze and 
a friend kindly supported me and said you should go and get a test and so the very first test I had um, came back positive and that was in the days prior to pre and post test counselling it was when there was only one drug available. It was pretty brutal. It was very brutal. The, the prognosis was you'd be dead in a couple of years if you're lucky. How did that actually play out? Did somebody tell you that face to face? The doctor didn't want to give me the results immediately um, because I think the doctors themselves were struggling in this evolving pandemic that people were still trying to understand. Um, but I was obviously very desperate for the results and he was just very apologetic and said, you know, you, you're positive. And it was, there was shock, absolute shock. So I, I went numb and felt a bit ill and a bit faint and I can remember feeling like I had visible blue rings, like a blue, poisonous blue ringed octopus. So I felt very toxic. But I had a friend who was kindly waiting back at the house um, to, you know, to support me if my results were positive. And I had a really good, strong network of friends and my family being really supportive. So that, that helped. But it was devastating. And the first three months was, um, I can't really re remember it in detail, but it was immense shock, I imagine. Did Vanessa Wagner evolve slowly or did, did she spring from your consciousness fully it, formed? It was slow because there was elements of drag in the dance work that I was doing with this ensemble called Dance Camp and so the women and the men were dressing up in crazy outfits doing hysterical uh, skits. So it was a natural progression and I developed a couple of other characters, a Greek cleaning lady character called Elna Godfrey and a, another one who used to host events and that morphed into me hosting parties at my house and then this character Vanessa just popped up from watching a midday movie called Mirror Mirror and this character Vanessa Wagner who I thought was hysterical so I just took the name, created my own look and she just progressed from there so it wasn't a reaction to the HIV it was just it was all happening. It evolved, it all sort of melded together. Yeah, it was a very fertile time in my life. Now there's a, a, a advertising campaign in which Vanessa features in bikini, hairy chested and all for Aussie Mail. Tell us how that came about and how that was received. I became notorious as that drag queen that can't dance and doesn't lip sync and people didn't get that that can't dancing was actually a reasonably sophisticated um, parody um, and a lot of oh she's not a real drag queen she doesn't shave her legs um, and that was all part of my shtick I wanted to uh, muck around with what it, what it meant to dress up and what drag was and what a character character was so that became pretty obvious pretty early on that I was this kind of thorn in the side of glamour drag you know, aspirational impersonation. This was more about ripping it apart and reconstructing it. I guess it was a bit postmodern, and I became reasonably popular through some parties and uh, became a bit popular in the mainstream through various events. And a lot of quite famous people used to attend my um, Jamie and Vanessa dance parties that I used to host with Greg Clark. And through that, connections happened, and a bit of corporate work came out of that. And I guess Aussie Mail at the time. Wanted, I don't know who recommended me to them, but you know, there was cricketers and mainly sports people and to their credit they kind of thought let's get this man who happily is happy in his body, doesn't want to shave his eyebrows off, doesn't want to change his body or augment his body to play another character, is happy for it to just be a mesh and it was really great. I found it a real celebration of difference that campaign. And in a sense, of course, it's unique because there's nobody else who does that. Yeah, I think Auntie Jack Jack did it before me. That was in a very different... Um, different context. Though. Different context. That was purely comedic, not lifestyle, really. Was that... Well, let me, don't let me put words into your mouth. I'm asking you. you Look, it's a ca it's, she's a character and and I'm once that I'm not in that character, I want to go back to being who I am, you mm. know, the individual mm. and... And I, you know, I like. The, I used to have real issues about masculinity when I was young because I was so petite and such a late developer, and didn't feel I was man enough and masculine. Couldn't wait to get, you know, my first whiskers and all that. So when I did physically develop to whatever I am, and, and that sort of changed through a lot of my dancing and me working, uh, changing my body, if you like, through my craft. 
I, I liked my body and I didn't want to change that. I didn't want to have to. I found shaving was an, an outrage. So there was times where I just kept the beard and did a freaky kind of monkey woman look in my drag. Let's talk about that because that really is quite crucial to the discussion we're having. Mm. You were talking about your sense of masculinity. How do you define that now? How do you, what are the things that you think make you masculine? Well, that, 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 they're very physical things I was talking about and that, that was at a time when you know, I, didn't, I hadn't really unpacked all that pressure that you know, our, the gender roles that were assigned are enormous constructs um, and that you know, we're not given a lot of room to move within that. And for me, you know, being a man is being able to be free in your body no matter how, what, what body you're, you're given and to be comfortable in that. And, and if it means that you're not a huge brute, then that, that's, that's masculine as well. And to, you know, to survive oppression and to miss out on all those rites of passages and to sort of have all these very special m moments that could have happened in your life being taken away as, as a man who has sex with men, that's a man, to survive that and not come out the other end Having, having suicided or being really angry and I mean I'm passionate and I do get a bit bitter and angry but I think for me being a man is being able to survive that and not compromise so you know yeah what about values moral values I'm thinking what sort of moral yardstick if you have one do well you I don't think they're different to whether you identify as a woman or a trans man or a um, trans woman or I don't think morals or ethics have any relationship to gender or gender identity. I think they exist as a human um, trait and... Do you have, I mean, do you have a faith or a spiritual code or... No, I'm a bit, You have your own? That's a space, that's, um, look, watch this space still. I, yeah, I don't, I, I feel like I have a bit of a, a spirituality but I have no connection to any religion. And I feel just looking at how religion um, still can interfere in democratic processes and in um, constructive debate and how supposed separation of judiciary, parliament and religion is often ignored and so I have a real kind of rejection of formal religion. What about the things that uh, you apply though yourself? I mean you have limits, you have moral yeah. limits. What are those? Uh, well, I remember Dad saying, I think the Ten Commandments are quite sensible, and, and I concurred, and I've never read the Bible, but I think those basic things, just wanting to be treated with respect, and therefore treating others with respect, um, but not being afraid to stand up for things that you feel strongly about, and if that means maybe being a little bit abrasive, um, then so be it. But, you know, ultimately it's about um, being accountable for your own impact really on others and having the insight to know when you're transgressing that yeah, yeah yeah is that something that you have developed or is it something that you one has naturally do you think i think it's developing still is it yeah i think um as i get older um there's a bit more self reflection um and maybe aspirations change or um acknowledgement that some things won't go where one expected them to go. That's all that kind of compounds and, and um, informs my kind of ethical and moral makeup. Um, but also through the change in, in work. So for the last two and a half years, in, on top of being a self-employed entertainer and activist, I've entered the HIV AIDS NGO sector. And um, that's, that's helped me, you know, formalize some ideas and also some of the research and some of the, the work I'm exposed to has helped me, you know, reflect on where I fit in in that spectrum of, you know, moral and ethical dilemmas. That we can... And that work that you're talking about, that work, I was just interested in what you do. What do you do in the NGO sector? Look, there's this, there's um, the Vanessa work that I mainly do is um, primarily still working with HIV AIDS organisations organisations around the country and so that is a form of what we've um, coined edutainment. So it's deal uh, talking with and... It's assist like infotainment. Yeah. 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 So it's using the kind of little bit of 
sweetness to help the medicine go down when talking about serious and sometimes sad and complex subjects, in this case HIV. So those forums continue around the country um, to help HIV positive people uh, maintain and manage their own health, but at the same time having a fun, colourful peer character who's one of their own, as an out positive person, help them get that information. The work I do in the NGO sector is similar, but I don't dress up. I'm a health promotion officer, and so that's disseminating um, information around sexual health, community engagement, um, homophobia, anti-violence. So fostering a sense of community, in, and in this case in regional Australia and the Northern Rivers. Do you do it because it gives you a sense of purpose? Is, or, as one of the reasons that you do it? Or because if I could, if I could earn my crust being in entertainment, that's what I would prefer to do, and that's something that I'm, you know, working on. I've got lots of ideas, but it's, it's a struggle financially to survive, and it's hard to be creative when you're struggling financially to survive. I find, um, although I know there's lots of people, that like um, J.K. Rowling who struggle but was able to produce, but it's not, it's not always that easy. So obviously having the security of a full-time job um, financially is really important. It's helped me with my self-image as well because as a self-employed person for a long time, I wasn't sure if I was capable of, of that. So it, there's a whole lot of reasons um, why it works for me, but absolutely I'm committed to the, the organisation and to um, working with the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community. It's like a passion, really, to hopefully not have to have that work in the future, that we are just treated as equals. How have you managed to, or how do you cope with uh, HIV life, both emotionally, if you like, internally, and from a health point of view, maintaining uh, your, as much as you can? Those two things are separate, but kind of connected. Yeah, they are intermeshed. Uh, emotionally, it's, it, it is still quite difficult. There's a, an enormous amount of stigma and you could argue that the general community don't know a great deal about the complexities of HIV, but also how treatment has changed and, and I think that's a responsibility of the federal government to maybe produce um, a, a campaign about where we are, how easily treated it is, um, how important it is for people to be on treatment and that it's not as um, easy to catch as maybe people might think. Um, I still talk to people, admittedly, in the regions who just call it AIDS still and come up to me and have seen you know, me on television from a documentary and pat me on the back and ask me how my AIDS is. And they mean well, but it's HIV, it's not AIDS. And that stigma, that misunderstanding and some of the fear and phobias is still really, can be really um, damaging and isolating. But I don't let it get to me because you know there's, there's some chronic illnesses that I'm not highly familiar with because they don't affect me. So I've got to understand that that's natural for people not to know about stuff that doesn't affect them immediately. Um, but you you look well. Yeah. You, you don't. There's no obvious sign of illness. So you no. must have a fairly good regime. I do, and I have to be very grateful that I was reasonably physically active in my teenage years. I didn't get supported by my father as much with sport. It was the 18 month older brother that was a bit more, you know, got that support. I'm not quite sure if they knew what to do with me. I was good at gymnastics, but that never got sort of pushed um, through to a natural end. There was family split up, a whole lot of issues there. That affected my last two years at high school, sort of living with my father, trying to support him with an errant sibling, um, other problems, and not a mother around. So that, that sort of interrupted a whole lot of my life. But so not so physical at that time, but then when I came back to Sydney, I took an interest in, in dance um, with the help of some friends who saw me dancing at a party and said, you should think about dancing. And so I took myself off to Sydney Dance Company, public classes, and from there I did a whole lot of yoga and tai chi and kung fu and worked with little tiny companies just hanging around with them and doing dance classes and then I finally got into a dance school in 1988 and did a two year certificate in performance dance which in, you know, included a daily um, ballet class and a modern class. 
So that was a real, you know, for two years I became an elite athlete just about. And from then on I've continued to, to pretty much... And this, this was an important part of the, of the, this helped you cope physically? I think it must have because I was probably in really prime fitness when I got HIV and it did really hit me hard. And I, I look back at old photographs and I can tell, you can see it sort of trying to suck the life out of me. Um, but I chose to to fight that. There was a period there where, um, you know, I tried to, I probably drowned it a bit in drugs and alcohol. Um, I had a, a... Did that help? No. And I had a scare. I had a weird sinus thing that went really toxic and I was in a lot of pain. And it was that fear of pain that, that um, initiated change. So I stopped all the drugs and alcohol for about two and a half years at the age of 30. And that was crucial. It was like still doing all my parties, still being the toast of the town, still being creative, um, but sort of being outside the bubble. And because, you know, the, the GLBT community can often be very um, surrounded by drugs and alcohol and we statistically use, use them more than the community as a way of coping with being an outsider. So that, that really helped. Um, and I've always just needed to physically be active because I've felt that it impacts on mental health. And that's being kind of um, confirmed, I guess, the more I read and the more I realise that we're living a more sedentary lifestyle, I'm sure that connects to mental health. So yeah, I swim a kilometre most mornings. I get up early and do a little stretch routine. And for me, that's what I think has saved me because you know a lot of people get peripheral neuropathy. A lot of people have terrible side effects from some of the medications get wasting of um, muscles from their face and whether or not I was just lucky, I was on the right treatments um, or whether it was my physical regime or a combination of all of those things that contributed to me staying pretty healthy. And you feel okay? I feel fabulous. Mm. I, you know, I really do. I, um, I mean, I work hard at it. Some mornings I get up and think, do I want to do this? And something deep inside me, it's probably a combination of you know, narcissism, not wanting to die, but also not wanting to live a life of pain. Like, I know we live in a time of, um, my partner calls it health morality, um, and that, you know, we're told that we constantly have to do things to prolong our lives as much as possible. I don't want to prolong it, but I don't want to suffer while I'm alive. So Keep that's quality my, up. Yeah, I, that's my main instigator. Tell us about your partner and your relationship. We've been together for seven years. Um, and I never thought I'd get a partner. I guess that was another response to the HIV was that I was toxic and unlovable and you know, an outsider, even more of an outsider. It was like the second... Um, as, as far outside as you can get. <laughs> I'm sure there's some other minorities in the world that are in a much worse situation than me, but for me it was pretty stressful. It was like, oh, you know, I just sort of started to formulate that I'm all right and I'm not a sick puppy and I'm not a pedophile and I can be around children and I'm... You know, all those negative messages that were just constantly poured on me as a young person. I was just starting to really, you know, free myself of those shackles. And then the HIV came. I was like, oh, it's like, you know, the blanket's been thrown back over me again. I've got to wrestle out from underneath it. Um, How did you meet your partner? I Believe it or not, on a dating site, on a dating website. And Why were you on a dating website? Because I couldn't meet people. I, and I moved to, I, I left Sydney 10 years ago it was expensive, um, career was kind of evolving, I was um, tired of being ripped off and just I was tired of the city um, mentality at that time. So I moved to the northern rivers of New South Wales, um, much lim more limited opportunities to meet people um, and so I resorted to the internet and that for years that was just like, you know, came up blanks um, and yeah, he seemed like a really nice person. We took a long time to actually date on the internet, talked a bit on the phone, and then he was busy studying and I was busy working and we finally met. What was the geography? Where, where was he living? He was about 30 k south of where I was living. And so... That's not impossible. Not impossible. <laughs> there was a river between us and a car ferry and a whole lot of stuff. But yeah, it was... Um, it was just really nice to meet so someone. So when you first met, did you instantly confirm 
your... I can't remember with him <laughs> because, you know, the law states that I have to tell people before I have sex with them, although now there's been an adjustment to that law that says that if I go to court and I can prove that I, you know, use reasonable measures, i.e. a condom, I have a defence, but that disclosure, as we call it, it's a really difficult thing for most people um, with a communicable disease, whether it's hep C or HIV. I'm pretty sure I must have brought it out in conversations prior to meeting him, but I can't be sure. All I know is that his friends knew who I was and were telling him, do you know who that is? And, and he didn't. And he didn't. No, he did know and he didn't, didn't bother him. He, didn't, right. he was keen to, to get to know me. So I guess the disclosure happened at some stage, but I can't remember when. So the relationship, seven years old, um, how would you describe it? Well, it's officially called a serodiscordant relationship, if you go to pathologise it or give it a strange medical term. So he's HIV negative. Um, so that's proof that you can have a relationship um, with one person positive and one negative and that can remain so, um, even though it is a risk for a lot of people in those relationships. Um, it's evolved. It's, 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 it's becoming, you know, a really strong bonded companionship as well, I guess. For me, it's it's the companionship and the friendship side of it's getting stronger, and we have lots to talk about. We're politically aligned and have similar kind of motivations, and maybe he's a tiny bit more cynical than me, which I love. You know, I thought Your I age? was the most cynical person in the world. Your age? Five years younger than you. Than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the context of you know dealing with your life now, which you seem to have done pretty well, what stands out as, as still a challenging thing? What, is it self-improvement? Is it money? You know, what, what do you feel that you have to solve? I, I look, I personally feel that, um, it's really interesting with my, with my work at the moment, but also with what I've done, it's about um, you know, we talk about cultural representation and we talk about nation-state nation identity and so much of that's myth-making, myth really. And I'm very frustrated by, um, you know, what, what is deemed Australian culture. And I feel that my stories, our stories, as um, people of diverse sexuality and gender identity, are missing from the, you know, metaphorical library of, of this country. And I feel really strongly about that. So I want there to be more representation in the media. I want there to be better stories about us. I want there to be interesting movies and films that might historically talk about how difficult it was. So if I can get my act together, I want to make a movie and try to um, not educate, but inform the general population about some of the struggles that, that we've been through, um, how far we've come and how far we've got to go. But um, at the moment, this marriage debate is crucial. It's um, if, if I, I don't want to marry my partner, but it sends a really dreadful message to especially young children that we are still unequal citizens. And it's an outrage, it's an utter outrage that in the 21st century that one of the most, um, you know, uh, 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 um, the marriage is such a strong cultural thing that means so much to people and it's such a public display and celebration of what makes us human and that's being denied us. And that's like being stabbed every day. It's being told that you're not part of that process. Um, and until that changes, you know, I will not be, be happy. That's, it's, it's more symbolic of a whole lot of other things, but, it, but it's really important. So I want that to change. Do you still feel as an outsider now? Yeah, but in a good way. Like, I sometimes feel like a bit of an alien sort of walk into a mall and think, do they really know what they're doing? Do they really want that outfit? Do they really need that? Do they really need to, cons you know, like I do feel like an outsider. I'm, I'm but not as, not as someone who was pushed out? No, 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 not really. I mean, I like the challenge of being a bit of an outsider too. So I like living in a regional town where maybe I stick out a little bit. And if I've put nail, black nail polish on from a gig, I like to leave it on because sometimes I like to like draw now. a bit of it. There's not much of it left. But I kind of <laughs> like creating that fascination. I like people to sort of 
wonder what's going on and yeah. you know to offer a bit of difference and i like seeing it myself i like walking down the street and seeing someone who's looks unique or unusual isn't you know that sort of off the rack consumer that we see so often yeah in some way individual that's the word i should have just used that <laughs> thank you very much you're welcome